You are watching the Eagle Report here at Latrobe Live. Coming up in today's episode, we have an exclusive interview with Latrobe University's Vice Chancellor. Sheridan Lee will be reading the news headlines. We have our regular segment of sports with Bilal and Ahmed. Everyone's favorite ACLA with Adam Ionidas. Liam Connors dives deep into the world of hot jams at La Trobe University. And Meg Kennedy has a special story for you today. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Eagle Report. The time is 12.01 p.m. and we're broadcasting live on upstart.net.au and the Upstart Magazine Facebook. My name is Adam Ineas and I'm completed today by my co-host, Meg Kennedy. Hello. Oh, you shouldn't have. <laughs> oh, stop it, you. So today we have the uh, Media Hub launch and we are very lucky to be able to interview the Vice Chancellor of La Trobe, John Dewar, and we are also joined by Professor Laurie Zion from the journalism department, who you may remember from the uh, show we had last week where he talked about his book, The Weather Obsession. Definitely. How are we, guys? I think we're good. How we're you, good. Rory? It's good. Yeah. Feeling very much at home again. Ah, it's, yeah. it's great to be back on air. How's yeah. that feeling here? <laughs> yeah. So with the Media Hub, obviously it's a very big day today. Uh, with the whole hub itself is obviously a big investment by the university. How much did you put in and why do you think it's worth it? Uh, well, I think the university spent about $600,000 on wow. refurbishing this, this uh, part of the Agora. Probably just as significant is the fact that um, if this weren't being used as a media hub, it would be a commercial outlet for something. I can't remember what it was before. A chemist. It was a <laughs> chemist. A, a chemist. Great. Big difference. Um, um, so the university's foregoing a bit of revenue as well. Um, in allocated, but I, I think um, it's just fantastic to have this space in the Agora. Um, you know, it's right at the heart of the university. People are here uh, all the time. They, they, it'll be a very visible space. Um, and the, the reason we did it was to support Laurie and his colleagues um, who wanted to, you know, make some innovations in the way in which we teach students and ensure that our, the Latrobe students um, studying media and communication go out into the, the workforce after they graduate with the best possible experience in an environment that replicates as closely as possible um, what, what a real studio might be like. In fact, this, Laurie, I suspect this is a whole lot better than a lot of studios <laughs> you've been in. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's the only, one, the only studio I've ever worked in where you can look out the window and there really are people just walking outside. Mm. So that, that's a first. Yeah. It's not just the green screen. It's not, yeah. ju it's it's not all just real. the green screen. Yeah. It's very sunrise or whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 People so waving. I think eventually our aim is to have you know uh, breakfast here from six to nine every day. Guys are going to be getting up really early. <laughs> and to have a whole, whole lot of noses pressed against the yeah, glass. Uh, <laughs> Poster <laughs> sign. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So obviously now we have three shows a week, uh, The Recovery, Ten Express, and of course yours truly. Um, uh, future plans? Uh, future plans? Uh, well, I guess the, the original kind of vision of what we were going to do was that this would be broadcasting every day, certainly in kind of key time slots when people are coming into uni or at lunchtime as well. So this is really just the start now, and I, I, you know what I'm imagining we'll be able to do is ramp up with uh, shows from students from from communication and media and other departments as well, such as creative arts. Uh, but I also think that this is uh, potentially a terrific resource across the whole university. I've actually got a new gig at the moment, uh, running the research focus area, Transforming Human Society. So we develop yeah. research projects and we want to have a weekly podcast uh, that's associated with all of our researchers. And so getting uh, researchers and other people in the university used to the idea of uh, being in front of a microphone, but also being able to explain what they're doing and to develop a set of podcasts that we can then put up on iTunes U so that the work that we're doing can engage the public right from the ground up. Definitely. So. And you already mentioned that you are setting up that podcast. Have any other outside sources, whether it be commercial or within the university, had an interest in actually using the space as well? Um, well, we've, we've certainly, I've, you know, I feel quite a few questions 
when the facility was being built. Uh, we decided to put all of that discussion on hold until actually after today when we're up and running. And I think the thing is now we can actually uh, show as well as tell. We can bring people here and show them what we're doing. But um, you know, I know from, from talks I've had with John and with other people uh, ac across different areas of the university that, you know, we, we'd like to throw it right open and say to archaeologists, come and do a weekly podcast to the, to the, great, uh, the, the great projects being done by a lot of our uh, staff in science and, and uh, allied health as well. So um, I think now that we've got this here, it's the real beginning, if you like, of actually uh, looking for business across the university to engage people in the university and hopefully down the track outside. You know, we're in a part of Melbourne uh, where, um, you know, the, a lot of the, the media needs of, of, of northern Melbourne, uh, you know, there's a question in my mind about whether they're being met. When you look at the, the community papers that come out every week, they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, and Latrobe being where it is in, in the middle of uh, the fastest growing part of the metropolitan area of Melbourne, uh, I, I think it's time for us to do an inventory of, you know, are there groups out there that might actually be able to... Mm. Uh, John, I don't know if this, this, this is something that, you know, you'd like us to pursue, but I, I would really like to see mm. us actually engaging with the broader community to see if we can help. Uh, capacity build uh, groups who are interested in, in using this facility for their own media needs. Mm. I think that's a great idea. That'd be yeah. good. Well, I know I had a, um, a podcast in the old studio, the pop culture one, so uh, excited to get that up and running in the new studio, finally. But uh, La Trobe used to have a radio station, Sub FM, yeah. which uh, closed after a decade in 2006. It yeah, so, it closed uh, the week I started here. <laughs> wow. <So. laughs> Don't feel any responsibility there, Larry. <laughs> no. Well, it just was like a slightly bad cloud of karma, it seemed, following me around. That, um, and uh, so, and I, you know, it's a bit of a strange thing. I mean, I, there, was a, there was a story, I think, in The Age about it closing down, and, uh, you know, I never really kind of understood why I couldn't have been saved. And so I think that's been part of, you know, a lot of my... Um, a lot of my push for us to get a facility like this was that, well, we used to have something. And, um, you know, I, I went, I, I taught for a while at Monash and, and actually did my PhD out there. We had a, a, a student station. And so it did feel 10 years ago like a bit of a gap that we suddenly didn't have a, a radio station here. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, what what's so great about today is we've got something that does all the things a radio station does, but, of course, a whole lot more. We're, we're um, you know, we're broadcasting in a format that looks a lot like TV, but it's all online, it's yeah. digital, and the potential a facility like this has will more than uh, make up for our, uh, our dark decade when we didn't have any, uh, anything that could broadcast out to the broader community or even just the campus. Definitely. Time of the future. <laughs> and I know, obviously, this has all just started. So do you see the Media Hub as an endpoint and kind of where we're at at journalism or do you see it being extended in the future, use it in kind of different ways than it is now? Is that something that will happen? I, I, I hope so. Yeah. Um, I mean, this has been built primarily as a student, uh, student learning facility primarily, but it, it, given, as Laurie said, how much um, equipment there is in here, it clearly has potential to do a lot more than that. Um, I think the, po the podcasting... Podcasting has become a real thing, as everyone, I'm sure, has noticed. Um, and actually, at Latrobe, we've developed quite a lot of expertise in that area already. Um, we had, for a while, one of the most popular iTunes U podcasts in the world. Wow. You know, we ranked top for a while, and then certainly in the top five for a while. And that's, that was the Emperors of Rome podcast that Rhiannon Evans and Matt Smith have been doing for quite some time now, about mm. four or five years incredibly popular and very effective in um, not just getting information out um, about a topic that a lot of people are clearly interested in, um, but also getting the Latrobe name out there and the expertise that we have here. Um, is that a, uh, sorry, is that a podcast that's still running at the moment? Yes, it's still going. Okay. Um, there's another one called Latrobe, uh, sorry, called Asia Rising, which is run by Latrobe Asia. Um, and again, you know, just very high quality um, and great, great publicity for the university, but also incredibly informative. Um, if, you, if you want to know what's going on in North Korea, for example, just mm. download the latest podcast they've done on that topic and 
you'll hear Nick Bisley and Ben Habib talk very knowledgeably about what the issues are there. So there's, there's already a, a, a big interest and expertise here, but I think if we can bring all of that together, um, make this facility available, as Laurie said, not just to the broader university community, but um, to outside groups. And I think the idea of engaging with uh, the community in Melbourne's north is, is, is fantastic. Um, this is an area that is probably not as well served through what you might call um, culture generally and media in particular as, as well as some other parts of Melbourne. Uh, and why shouldn't the tribe, you know, really, really try and turn that around? Exactly. I completely agree. I, th I, th I think too. There's, you know, that's partly about engaging with the community. I think that, um, and you know, I'm interested in what you guys think. That the more that our students are actually part of that process as well, working with community groups, producing material for them, um, then I think that also provides, you know, another. Uh, yet another step in our uh, onward march for work integrated learning. Um, and I guess that, uh, you know, when I, when I started here 11 years ago, we just never were able to do anything on campus. Anything that involved media production, even even getting an article published online, would ha you know, students would have to go and do their internship somewhere else. Uh, what I, I guess, w you know, when you ask is this the end point, I was thinking, I hope not. I hope we're going to create something where so much of the student experience can be uh, not just learning how to do things and then going out to do internships, but actually bringing the internships onto campus and liaising with groups all over the place. So um, that's where I'd like to see it go, because I think that, um, you know, the, the oldest journalism school in the world, it's a place I've spent some time at, uh, the Missouri School of Journalism. When I went and visited there for the first time a few years ago, I was really struck by the fact that they set up the, the journalism school in the middle of a small town in Missouri and launched simultaneously the local daily newspaper, which of course the students worked at, and then uh, um, more recently bought a TV station that's an affiliate of the NBC network. So all these, you know, the paper and the TV station are all run by students from, from the school. So I'm thinking, you know, that I brought that back and um, uh, certainly nagged ver various deans and former vice chancellors about the fact that if we don't start somewhere here, we're going to get left so far behind. So one of the things that's so satisfying about today is I can see now, you know, we've got something that's even better, I think, than a lot of the other media facilities you can see uh, on a lot of campuses. But it is, to me, really important that this evolves into something that will make this the place people really want to come and do their uh, media degrees and uh, that will also I hope uh, earn its keep as uh, if not you know totally on a financially financial sense will certainly uh, will certainly be something that uh, bonds us more with with the university community and the broader community oh, definitely anything to get the uh, the practical experience yeah. to the students is is a win-win now I'm going to do something that Laurie told me to never do in my first year. I'm going to ask a double-barreled question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is directed at, a, at you, John. Um, <laughs> something I've always wanted to know is, so you're the vice chancellor at Trobe University. Is there a chancellor? And if so, what do they do? <laughs> <laughs> and does Latrobe have one? <laughs> yes. Um, so the answer to your first question is, yes, there is a chancellor. Um, his name is Richard Larkins. Okay. Um, former Vice Chancellor of Monash, um, a very distinguished person in many, many different ways, um, and an excellent Chancellor. So, what do they do? Um, well, the Chancellor is a bit like the chair of the board in a corporation. Uh, they, he, his main job is to chair council, um, and in that capacity, uh, he also is my boss, essentially. Um, so, it's a bit like <coughs> a CEO reporting to the chair of the board. Um, so my chancellor is the, is the chair of the board equivalent. Okay. Um, but he, his job is to ensure that I'm doing my job um, and that the whole university is, is d doing the right thing in terms of does it have a strategy, is it achieving that strategy, um, are we compliant with all the various obligations we have to meet, particularly to government. That's the job of council and, and as chair of the council that's, that's what he has to to worry about. Um, my job is the kind of day-to-day -day management and okay. theoretically there's a, a strict divide between governance, which is what the Chancellor looks after, and, and management, which is what I look after. Okay. Does that help? That does. That, mm -hmm. That's a great explanation. Thank you for that. Now another question. Yeah. Where is Car Park 5? 
<laughs> <laughs> because we covered that on our our first show that there actually is no car park five. Conspiracy <laughs> theories the of which hope. <laughs> the great disappearance. I don't know. That, oh, can I take that on notice? <laughs> you, you, you can. I'll write down my email. <laughs> back to me on that one because that's. Oh, is that right? We don't, have, we don't have a car park five. Where did it go? Did, <laughs> did we have a car park five? Which just someone, disappeared. Could that someone be the next it? great infrastructure project? <laughs> 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 University. Well, yeah, Trobe University is proud to present man. car park five. <laughs> Now, oh, I want to change it to, around to something a bit more serious. Mm. And I understand that you have spoken about this publicly. And obviously, in recent news, it's been revealed that in a nationwide survey, Latrobe has had the highest number of sexual harassment and assault cases of any Victorian university. How did you feel when the results were published? Uh, well, obviously very concerned. Um, but if I can just clarify, yeah. um, it's true that we were the highest with the reported numbers of se sexual harassment oh, so, incidents yep. not for sexual for assault, assault. Yep. um I'm, i mean none of no incident of this kind is um is uh, to be tolerated or, or of course, welcomed yep. of course but um we 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 were uh you know it, it looked didn't look good on the sexual harassment side one thing that um we if you dig into the data a bit more what it shows is that um, public transport to and from campus is a particular hotspot. Um, and obviously that's something that um, we will do what we can to address. Um, but we need to work with government as well. Um, so we've, I've written to Jacinta Allen, the Minister for Transport, to say that you know, we're very concerned about this and we're keen to do what we can with government um, to address um, incidents of sexual harassment on public transport because obviously our students are uh, quite reliant on public transport and we've done a lot to try and improve it you know with the shuttle bus and so on uh, but we don't want to discourage people from using it because of you know there's the possibility that they might have a bad experience so I think it's really important that we we address that but look the um, the, the survey findings were really useful one of the most important things they told us for example was that um, most students don't really know where they can go for help if they experience something like this. Um, and those very small number of students who did said they didn't find the help very useful. Um, so we know that we've got a big job to do to improve the visibility of the support. And there's a lot of support available, actually, but it's probably a bit scattered. Um, and that when students do need help, that they get effective help. And advice. Um, so that's why we've launched um, a s new service called Speak Up, um, and I hope that you've noticed the publicity around yep. campus Definitely, about that. Yep. That's designed to be a one-stop shop, so people who are concerned either for themselves or on behalf of others can ring the number or go and see them and say, look, um, you know, I need help or my friend needs help. Um, and then their job is to make sure that the, the right level of help of the right sort is is available quickly, so we we're doing a lot uh, to address this, um, <clears throat> and we've committed along with every other university in the country to redoing this survey again, probably in about three or four years' time, um, so that we can see whether all of the initiatives that we're putting in place um, will make a difference. But I, I think you know th there's a there's a continuum here of um, from tri what we, people might think of as trivial acts of sexism or harassment through to the very serious cases of assault. Our philosophy is, that, is really a zero tolerance philosophy, that ev even the small acts of sexist behaviour um, are indicators of really a lack of respect um, and that that can then lead to other things that become more serious Definitely, over time. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to promote a culture of respect, not just around gender, but around a whole range of differences that people have on campus, whether it's sexuality. And incidentally, one of the things that the survey uncovered was that it's our LGBTI community who are far more at risk, uh, even than women, from harassment and assault on campus. Um, so you know, the, the, this is a, a complicated 
s set of interlocking issues that we have to tackle in an interlocking sort of way, Definitely. and that's and that's what we're doing. I'm chairing a, a thing called the Campus Safety Group, um, which is looking at everything from how we organise lighting through to our relationships with the Victoria Police, and you know, there's a really a lot of work now going in a much in a much more coordinated way than previously. The the other way of reading the survey, incidentally, was that um, <clears throat> what the figure that really surprised me was not the reported incidents of sexual assault or sexual harassment on campus. It was the rate reported by students of sexual harassment and sexual assault anywhere in their lives. So that includes off campus. So the national figure for on campus was 21% in the case of sexual harassment. The national figure for anywhere was 51%. Now, that is completely off the scale. Mm. Um, <coughs> the surveys that have been done previously have shown that in the general community, about 21% of women report sexual harassment in any one year. Now, that's unacceptably high, but the on-campus reported rate was uncannily similar to that rate, but there's something about being a uni student, and it's not specific to La Trobe, this is across the board, yep. about being a uni student, particularly a female uni student, that means that out there, off campus, you're particularly vulnerable, much, almost twi more than twice as vulnerable. Now, whether that's to do with um, the age range or whether it's to do with the fact that uni students work part-time perhaps more uh, and they're in more vulnerable situations. I, we do, we've got to find out more about that because to me, that was the statistic that really hit me in the face. Definitely, yeah. Um, 51% of women students yeah. reporting somewhere in their lives uh, an incident of sexual harassment of in the previous. And in fact, what it tells us is that students are safer when they're on campus than when they're off. off. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Which is, I mean, that just... In comparison to that. Yeah, we just yeah, need, we need to understand that better. Of course, yeah. And it's great that where there is action being taken oh, after is. this. And Absolutely. I'm sure that it's going to be completely different next time we have a look and see what's going I on. I hope so. I Definitely. Hope so. Yeah. so thank you both for coming on. Obviously, we're super excited. It's officially up and running now. Yeah. It's all official. Um, yeah, so thank you both for your time. Thanks, and we guys. hope you enjoy it. Well. <laughs> well done. And Good definitely. Work. Congratulations to you two as well. <laughs> Thank and, you. Yeah, I hope you, I hope you hope you enjoy the rest of the year. Are you both graduating this year? No. I'm graduating. You're graduating. But I'm off seas, off for an exchange next semester. Oh, good. Where yeah, are you going? America. Okay. Um, at Loyola, Loyola University. Oh. Hopefully. I shouldn't be saying this because I don't want to jinx myself, but <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, good luck for the rest Thank of the year. Thank you so much. Thank you. you Thanks too. for having us on. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So, so basically what I'm going to do is continuing on with um, the sexual assault. I did a vox pop with a few students about yes. their thoughts on it, yeah. and it's basically just about what they thought and where they think the La Trobe community can do better. Yeah. So if you okay. want to take a look, we'll see I'm how we feel. Quite surprised okay. by that because living on campus, I feel like there are security roaming around, and there's good lighting in the areas if you need to go to the laundry or anything. And I feel like um, I just don't feel like how that could have happened because I have a ex safe experience of the environment that I lived in like this year and last year. And what do you think Latrobe can do better if these things are occurring? Well, I guess there are a lot of um, security on campus, but I've walked through campus at night and not seen anyone. And I do know they're around, but maybe more patrols and more people roaming around when these things are occurring might help out. I was pretty shocked, to be honest. Um, I didn't do the survey, but um, I didn't realise how many people were affected. Um, but I guess it does make sense. Like I did live on college and you can sort of see the stuff that goes on and the sort of mentality that's around living on campus and things like that. Like um, what goes on is everyone's business, which is, and sort of the levels of sexual harassment really sort of shocked me a fair bit. So I think it's quite interesting, the results, and is a real eye opener. Do you think the college culture, which obviously surrounds a lot of drinking and partying, might have contributed to these results? I think it's a, like a major factor. Um, the fact that... Uh, there's not really much sort of supervision that goes on. It's sort of all just in rooms and dorm rooms and things like that and um, anything can sort of happen and it's to an excess as well, like all the drinking and things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And what do you think Latrobe can do better in the future to stop uh, a result like this happening again? I think uh, being aware of the fact that this is going on and taking steps to 
right from sort of day one, I think, with the people that are coming onto campus to sort of drill it in to sort of make sure that everyone's aware of what is sexual harassment and what they're doing. Um, I just sort of think that having information sessions just sort of at the start when they're sort of everyone's getting used to what campus life is like, um, establishing that sort of stuff and I don't know, sort of drilling it in every so often just to remind everyone. Um, and also I think just to make sure that there might be more supervision or something like that perhaps. Like it is, we're adults but you know, alcohol can do a lot of stuff so yeah. I think um, on the before the release of the results I knew it would be bad uh, but when it actually came out I was like shocked beyond belief. I felt sick, I felt scared. Um, the fact that the university um, and the represented student body hadn't done anything about this actually made me feel so sick and scared and angry that I knew that me and a few other people we had to do something to stand up against this. Um, it's actually so horrible that this has gone on and with the high high numbers that it is there's no way that they haven't known about it it is quite apparent that they have hidden this they have been too scared to say anything about it but now it's out and now it's time that we demand action and what are you wanting to do personally to try and avoid this issue coming up again? Yep, so we have been doing rallies and we'll continue to do these rallies. Um, we're also working with some student uh, bodies like Speak Up, um, organising something to bring to the university. We've got four demands, um, the first being a compulsory consent module that all new students have to do before the first census date. Um, if not, they'll get a sanction on their account until it's done. Um, the second being sexual assault response training for all um, first responders and that includes lecturers and um, security. Our third is a clear advertised procedure about what happens when reporting um, sexual assault. Uh, one of the biggest things that came out was 90% of students didn't actually know what to do if they were assaulted so we need that clear policy there so students know what to do when they're in danger or if they have had something happen to them. Um, the fourth is more support for colleges. Um, I think a lot of this comes from the way of college life um, and the university really needs to be the one to lead that push to change the environment on colleges. Yep, definitely. And what do you think the university can do from an admin perspective themselves to avoid this horrible situation pretty much happening again? Yeah, um, I think like... The, I don't think it'll ever stop, which is unfortunate to say, um, but they do need to be the ones that are putting names out. Um, hiding the people that are doing these terrible things is just promoting this behaviour. Um, these people are protected from what they do, and that is the big thing here. So on the admin's perspective, they need to make this known. Um, it can't be hiding behind desks and... Uh, pity like small little apologies that are posted online that is not good enough they need to answer for what's going on and if they don't it's just going to get worse before thanks for that meg that's a lovely package and Thank thanks you. to uh john dua the vice chancellor of the tribe university and laurie zion for uh letting us interview them for the launch of the media hub it is now 12 28 p.m and here is sheridan with the headlines hello thank you adam <laughs> And Meg? Uh, so the High Court is set to deliver its decision about the future of the plebiscite just after 2pm today. A Commonwealth lawyer has defended the government's decision to take the money for the plebiscite from a contingency fund for an urgent and unforeseen item without parliamentary approval. Opposition to the government's plebiscite told the High Court on Tuesday that it was unconstitutional and there was nothing urgent or unforeseen about the plebiscite. They want the High Court to declare the funding unlawful and rule that the survey cannot go ahead. Pending the High Court's decision, the Australian Bureau of Statistics would start sending out the survey on September 12. A Senate inquiry revealed that the ABS has already spent $14.1 million on the plebiscite. The Australian childcare industry is coming to a halt this afternoon, with many walking out in protest over low pay. 3,000 are set to walk out at 3.20pm because that's when they believe they start working for free. The United Voice Union stated that most in childcare work for a measly $21 per hour. Independent CANS MP Rob Pine has been referred to the state's ethical committee after he signed a man into parliament who was charged with stalking another MP. Keppel MP Brittany Lauger, who is pregnant, alleged she was put at risk inside state parliament after a man charged with stalking her was allowed to enter the building by Mr Pine. Petros Kalasarad is facing trial for allegedly stalking Mrs Lauger 
who is pregnant with her first child in June next month. He is accused of harassing and threatening her on social media as well as her address and phone number between February 20 and August 27 this year. Australian Conservative State MP Rachel Carling Jenkins revealed that her estranged husband was charged with a child pornography offence last year in an emotional speech to State Parliament today. Dr Carling Jenkins reported her husband after her and her son discovered his childhood his child pornography collection leaving him the next day. He is in prison. Facebook has confirmed that they sold $1,000 worth of advertising to 500 inauthentic accounts with Russian links during the 2016 US election, prompting concern about Russian activity during the campaign. The advertising did not reference any particular political candidate, rather focused on divisive and social political content, such as racism, immigration and gun rights. Spending occurred from June 2015 to May 2017. American President Donald Trump has declared a state of emergency with Florida preparing for the potential impact of the record-breaking Hurricane Irma, which tore through the Caribbean with at least one confirmed dead. It is the strongest ever recorded in the Atlantic Ocean, a Category 5 sustaining 185 miles per hour wind for more than a day and leaving widespread damage on the French islands of Barbuda and St. Martin. The Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, Gaston Brown, told the press that the island is 90% destroyed. Close behind, Tropical Storm Jose and Cartier were upgraded to hurricane status recently. Former Fairfax media journalist and television presenter Peter Luck has died aged 73. His close friend and journalist Mike Carlton confirmed that he died last night after a long and painful battle with Parkinson's disease. Luck was a columnist for the Sun Herald in the late 1990s and now on to the weather. Partly cloudy with a slight chance of rain on Thursday with a top of 16. Friday could reach 13, cloudy and a chance of rain with hail. The weekend is cloudy and windy with a minimal chance of rain. And this has been Sheridan Lee for the Eagle Report. Stay classy, Latrobe. Excellent. Thank you, Sheridan. Thanks, now, Sheridan. we have Calvin in the studio and Hi. he's going to give us, hello, <laughs> give us a deep <laughs> look into Lovely, the issues that are regarding Australian news lately. So, thanks for joining us, Calvin. What can You're you welcome. tell us? I can tell you about a lot of things, but only three. <laughs> That is a lot. That's more than that is, two. It is. It's what we like to hear. Two. Uh, so let's start with the Manus Island payout. So what's happened is a payout in compensation of $70 million has been authorised by the Australian government uh, to be uh, given out to um, asylum seekers detained in Papua New Guinea on Manus Island. And this has been since September 6th. So why is this payment happening? Basically, it's happening because the asylum seekers alleged that they've been mistreated, um, and they've been illegally detained between 2012 uh, and 2016. Um, and there's and this uh, deten detention, the word is uh, that I'm looking for, the detention has uh, been declared illegal by the Papua New Guinean government. Um, inmates, asylum seekers, detainees, whatever you want to call them, have said that they've been, um, uh, have living conditions that are below standards, abuse, violence, all, all around really nasty stuff yeah. and um, a hundred and uh, a thousand and nine hundred and five men have sort of brought forth these cases and uh, the government has called this deal of giving 70 million dollars prudent but have denied their wrongdoing okay so will the money be actually paid out to the individuals themselves yes yes it will um, Justice Cameron McCauley said that the funds will allow lawyers to allocate the money for, um, uh, depending on individual cases. Okay. Um, and over 1,300 people have registered for this settlement. And it, uh, that represents the majority of asylum seekers detained since 2012. So what will the payout be? Somewhere in the ballpark of thirty to $40,000. Okay. Um, and prior to this, there was $20 million offer, uh, offered as a settlement uh, to which um, uh, that there was $20 million offered a rather than a trial, to which uh, the immigration minister, uh, Peter Dutton, said that an appropriate outcome would come because a trial uh, would have cost tens of millions of dollars in legal fees alone. So... It is what been, it is, basically. Yeah, there's been yeah. some sort of back and forth, but ultimately this is what's happening. Definitely. So, obviously, that has might have caused a lot of drama, but are the refugees themselves actually happy with this deal? Mm -hmm. Again, it's a sort of yes and no. So there are a few, there are a lot, like 1,300, who are happily taking this deal. 
There are others, um, such as one uh, Iranian refugee, Amir Taginia, I probably butchered that, but <laughs> he said that uh, getting money is not the issue. It's not the matter of the money. It's sort of what they've done. The money is not enough in compensation. For it's it's the, the act. Yeah. It's, it's that they've been detained illegally, mistreated, allegedly. I have to cl- clarify that. But, um, yeah, for them it's not. For others, um, they say it's, it's just better than nothing. Um, one such man, uh, Nazar Jafar Zadeh, again, butchered that. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, uh, said that we came by boat, and Australia hate us because we came by boat. Because we know we can't do anything, so we should accept this money and look in the future maybe somewhere else. Are there problems with the refugees receiving the money themselves? Or? Yes, this is a slight issue. They do not have Papua New Guinean bank accounts. Um, that makes sense. So that does sort of uh, limit what they can get. But there is uh, efforts to, like, either in forms of check or in direct payment to give them the money. Definitely. And on to another one of your issues. I hear that you're talking about the pe- plebiscite. I am talking about the plebiscite. <laughs> the plebiscite. So, when is the plebiscite actually happening and what can you tell us about it? So, the plebiscite is happening on September 12th. That's when we should start to receive the ballot papers. Um, and that goes up from September 12th to about November 15th is when the final results will be tallied. And what exactly will it be asking? Well, it'll basically be asking, should we change the marriage laws to allow for same-sex marriages? But um, there is sort of warnings to pay close attention to the wording because a question could be worded something along the lines of, should the marriage laws stay the same? Which is seedy, but could potentially be something that happens where they want people who say, like, we're voting yes, so then they, they vote yes without even looking. Okay, so what will a yes majority bring? It won't bring marriage equality. It will not result in a, an immediate result, but it will sort of put a lot of pressure on the government to change the law, and there will be a vote will after that. Will it really? Uh, yes, it should. <laughs> <laughs> it very much We're should. We're hoping so. I hope so, yes. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and now, finally, uh, uh, some big news that happened uh, about two weeks ago, a week ago, Give or take. Australia Day related news. Australia Day related news. Yes, we're no longer having barbecues on Australia Day in Melbourne. Oh no! Really? No well, one hundred. We might be have. We might be, but um, they're going to enforce that, are they? <laughs> so the Yarra Council have voted to no longer celebrate officially Australia Day. No longer doing the citizenship ceremonies out of respect for Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. Um. And this is happening from two thousand eighteen. So we've still got pretty much a. Oh, yeah. No, we don't. I no, lied. no. We've got, in, a, we've got the, four the months. Next the, next, got, comes into the next Australia Day, we will not be celebrating. Year. But it is only about two councils that have voted for this. So it's not a massive... So which was the other councils? The Yarra, Yarra City Council? And... Yeah, it's just two councils in Melbourne. And so Darabin as well. Oh, Darabin, yeah. Which is a bit close to home for us. Yes. Obviously, it's our own council here at La Trobe. So what is the government's actual reaction to this decision? Um... It's a bit like uh, a disappointed father, really. Malcolm Turnbull is not happy with, uh, with this decision. They, he kind of gives the whole sort of Australia Day is a cherished event that, you know, brings about mateship and camaraderie. Um, and so, yeah, they're not very happy about this sort of thing that we're doing. Change. But the thing is, it's not really a new event. It's only since 1935. And prior to that, there was never really interest in a national holiday. So it just kind of happened. Yeah, it, it was 1901, the Federation of Australia, that brought about that sort of desire for it. But apart from that, there's been no real desire to have a national day. Right now, even then, it's just Australia Day is the day you go out to a barbecue, listen to Nova 100, and get pissed. I mean, you'd still do that. Yeah, Except exactly. you listen to Triple J and it. not Nova. <laughs> but thank you for joining us, Calvin. I'd listen to Triple M, personally. Do you? I listen to... I don't listen to radio. <laughs> I don't listen to radio either. It's okay. It does. But thank you, Calvin. Thank you. And uh, now we've got a package by our lovely assistant producer, Liam Connors. Hot Jam. Check it out. Hot Jam Thursdays! Hot Jam Thursdays! 
Uh, we've got a keen passerby now. I'll just ask him a question. Hey, sir, can you just have a moment to talk about Hot Jam Thursdays? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, what do you think about Hot Jam Thursdays? Uh, it's just a great initiative. Um, yeah, it's it's great to be talking about mental health and uh, and getting it all out there. And, and what better way to do it by through Hot Jams? Who would have known that a random stranger where we've never released our mission statement would know about it? So, fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. Hi, I'm Bruno O'Connor, and welcome to Hot Jam Thursday. Hot Jam Thursday. I'd like to, uh, oh, have I? Oh no, the jam. Oh no, the jam. There we go. Uh, I'd like to bring out Jared Clark and Fergus Selkirk Bell, the original founders of Hot Jam Thursday. Boys, come on up. Come on up, guys. Gentlemen, just for everyone. Oh, come, come through, Jared. Right up. Oh, you just want to stand, stand next to me? <laughs> so, gentlemen, you two are the co-founders of Hot Jam Thursday, one of the most successful groups on Facebook and even on the Latrobe Stalker space. Yeah, we know. <laughs> Can you just let everyone know, what is Hot Jam Thursday? Yeah, we good? We're on? Yeah, are we, are we on? Yeah, yeah, we're on. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, so, Hot Jam Thursday, is, it was um, created just as a <laughs> kind of a get-together with mates, just to listen, obviously, to the jams being... Um, we've got an example actually today for you. So this is a jam donut. Um, I'll, get, I'll let Fergus go into it a bit more, but um, yeah. Ferg? <laughs> yeah, so basically the idea around it is that we go to the hot jam van that we can see over there, we buy a hot jam, and then we request a song to be judged by the hot jam council. And what are, what are the uh, two requirements for the songs to be in the playlist? So it has to be hot, and it has to be, has to be a jam. Okay, so really simple stuff there. Hot Jam Thursday. As the newest uh, member of the Hot Jam Post, Abby, how are you? Oh, well, oh good, thanks. <laughs> good. Uh, where did you first hear about Hot Jam Thursday? It was a quiet afternoon last year. I was just walking past uh, Glen College. And um, walked past the second south yep. and heard some hot jams coming from a room. Good. And uh, what do you like most about Hot Jam Donuts? They're hot. Yep. No, and the, they're jammy as well. Is that is that one? No. Bit of jam. Bit of jam. Cool. Well, that's great. As you can see, everyone loves it. That's on. We on? Okay, sweet. <laughs> what do you love most about Hot Jam Thursdays? You eat a hot jam. You get to listen to hot jams, and as a collective, you get hot and jammy together. We've just had a question come through. Can you have too much jam in the donut? Oh, that is a tough one. You can definitely have too little, but my opinion is you cannot have too much. People like most of the jam donuts, but they look after, you know, sometimes chocolate donuts. So yeah. maybe we'll be introducing them later on, but just now jam and sugar donuts. <laughs> We've, we have we have got the inside scoop. There may be chocolate donuts. Nuts about Teller, watch out. A few moments later. Sun mere hum safar Kya tujhe itni si bhi khabar Ye teri saan se chalti magar Rahunga yun hi zindagi bhar Thank you so much. That bro. is that is I think, hey, sorry, news just in, that is confirmed as the hottest of hot jams. So, fantastic. No, thank you very much, guys. Hot Jam Thursday. Hey, mate, did you want to talk about Hot Jam Thursdays? Yeah, the donuts. Yeah, what do, you, what do you reckon, though, mate? Do you like Hot Jam Donuts? So, yeah, do you just, just have a jam donut? Oh, that's all right. Too many jams. It's just classic. All right, mate. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, that's good. Uh, so, guys, at the moment, we've got a very successful group. So, we've got 200 people, a bit of self-promotion. Um, is there any plans to maybe expand or turn Hot Jam Thursdays into something else rather than just a group that loves uh, music and Hot Jam Donuts? We're still going, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, we are looking um, to be a non-for-profit organisation as we're slowly growing. Um, to increase mental awareness um, in youth, I guess, as well. So, Yeah, so basically we'll, we want to get as many people down um, here on a Thursday just to hang out, socialise, listen to some hot jams and um, just enjoy being around others. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, as you can see, I really would like to interview a couple more people, but... 
Everyone's just enjoying the jams. I don't want to really interrupt them, so. Hot Jam Thursday. Thanks again, guys, for joining us for Hot Jam Thursday. We're here every Thursday. You get your hot jam done, it's going to be great. Follow us on social media. Jared, where can you find us on Facebook? Uh, hot Jam Thursdays. Berg, what about on Instagram? Yeah, again, Hot Jam Thursdays. How about on uh, Spotify, Daniel? Yes, follow us on Spotify at Hot Jam Thursdays 2017. Jaina? Thanks for watching. Stay hot and stay jammy. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, guys. It's the Eagle Report. The time is 12.46 p.m. We're streaming live on upstart.net.au and Facebook, Upstart Magazine. Follow us on Twitter, Eagle Report LTU. And now it's time for the sports segment, which hey, everyone boys. loves, except for me. <laughs> Joined by Ahmed Abouid and Bilal Ali, our resident sport experts. How Very are we going, much. guys? We'll have you on board by the end of the segment. Oh. <laughs> Will we? Is, is that how good it is? <laughs> That's how good it is. Okay, fair enough. Goes. Adam, thanks for the intro. It's as right. flattering as it was. <laughs> All right, um, we'll get straight into football, uh, and by that I mean soccer, for all of you who, who don't know it by its real name. Uh, we have the senior editor of the Daily Football Show, Joel Frucci, on the line, or on Skype. How are you, Joel? Good, Bilal. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, some developing news has just come in that the AFC uh, has launched an investigation into uh, Tuesday's World Cup qualifiers. Um not much has been said so far. Not much has been disclosed to the public. Uh, what have you heard? I know you've um, penned a piece on the Daily Football Show. Yes, yeah, so there's not a lot to it uh, so far. But uh, from the AFC's statement on the matter, it's about a, um, an issue of political uh, neutrality. Uh, so make of that what you will. But uh, there's not much to it just yet. Hopefully in, in the next few hours or even the next day, we'll see uh, some more meat on the bone. But uh, it has, has to be stressed that no... No team, no official, no referee, no players have been implicated uh, in this so far. Yep. And um, to the real stuff, uh, stuff that actually happened that everyone witnessed, um, uh, we, we were both at the game. Uh, Australia, oh, we won, but it feels like we lost to Thailand because uh, ultimately we didn't uh, make the World Cup. Uh, we'll take a look at the highlights of the Japan game first, which is uh, really where, where it was all lost. Um, I think... I think uh, in that in that game, we we were expecting a draw. I think uh, most of the country was expecting a draw, but um, uh, we we did end up uh, suffering the loss. We'll take a look at the highlights now. Uh, well, look, the Japan game really. I think that came down to uh, team selection with with Ange Postecoglou. I think he got it uh, all wrong at the selection table. We played without a recognised striker, and, and really, in the end, um, we we didn't deserve anything from the game. Despite the fact that we dominated the stats, we had the lion's share of possession, uh, had a lot of passes, we didn't really uh, create anything with that. And uh, ultimately, we were toothless. And really, Japan definitely deserved the win. They were by far the better side. We were our coach, uh, and uh, the scoreline reflected that. And they're off to uh, they're off to the World Cup now in Russia. And uh, unfortunately, they couldn't get the job done for us, funnily enough, when we needed them to uh, against Saudi Arabia on Wednesday morning, which uh, had they have won that game as well, uh, then we would have uh, joined, joined them. But uh, uh, sadly, not to be, and we have to do it the hard way now. Yeah, and then we came up against uh, Thailand on Tuesday night, as we just mentioned. Uh, so many shots on target. I think it was 21, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, was, uh, and uh, I believe 42 shots uh, in total. Uh, absolutely ridiculous stats. Um, <laughs> as you've mentioned uh on, on the Daily Football Show podcast, this game wasn't where our qualification uh, was lost uh, or, or, or almost lost because we do have the playoffs. Uh, it was actually in the previous matches, but how did you see this game and um, how how do you think uh, we went about uh, getting those three, four goals that we needed? Well, look, pound for pound against Thailand, it was actually a good performance. I think it's it's been lost on everybody that uh, that that was the case because obviously we didn't get enough goals to actually progress into into Russia. We only won two one when, in the end, we needed to win by at least three goals to get on top of Saudi Arabia and push ourselves above them. But it was a good performance against Thailand. On, on, on another day, we could have easily won the game, even eight or nine nil. We had that many shots on goal. It was up in the forties, hit the post three times in the first half. So realistically, we could have been four nil up by half time. It just wasn't to be. Um, but look, now we have to turn our attentions uh, to Syria, who we play uh, in the next uh, round of playoffs in, 
in Sydney, pardon me, and also uh, at a mutual venue uh, still to be confirmed. But look, the Syrians will play uh, very much in a similar way to Thailand. They'll they'll sit back, likely with the back four. Um, we'll dominate the game, um, and they'll sort of sit back, push up, attack on the counter attack, which is really a glaring hole uh, in uh, in our armour. Um, but look, so far as the formation, which has been uh, in the gun recently uh, with Ange Postacoglu, that's not going to change. I think it's too late to change that now. A lot of people have been calling for a return to a back four, which heralded success uh, in those early qualifiers, which really is, is where uh, where we lost our, our way a bit. Uh, we drew with Thailand, we drew with Saudi Arabia, and we, of course, we lost to Japan all the way from home, and that's what cost us uh, in the end. So now we have to do it the hard way, up to, up to four more matches before we make it to Russia. Yeah, and Dor, just before I let you go quickly, I just want to get uh, your tip for the EPL match of the round. Uh, it is Manchester City coming up against Liverpool. How do you see that one going? Yeah, well, that's the one that stands out, isn't it? Um, and it, really, it's an intriguing game. I see a few subplots uh, in this one. For, for mine, it's almost one of the best attacks uh, in Europe, you've got Mo Salah, Roberto Firmino, Daniel Sturridge, Adam Milano, these kind of guys for Liverpool coming up against the Manchester City team that really this season is when they really need to, to uh, shake up the Premier League and almost really push on for the, to the title because if they don't win it, then I could almost see Pep Guardiola losing his job. He was <laughs> certainly lucky that uh, he didn't lose it last season. And by his own admission, if he was at, at uh, one of his previous clubs, Bayern Munich or Barcelona, that may have been the case. But look... City's defence has always been uh, their issue. That's where they fell over last season. They'll, they've been very leaky in defence, a bit less so this season, although they, they still have conceded goals. So really, it's going to be uh, it's going to be that attack versus the defence. Uh, and uh, normally, defence wins out. But uh, look, I, I actually see Liverpool winning this game. I think, and uh, if they can get the job done, it'll be a huge step for them uh, as they look to claim their own first ever Premier League title. Mm. All right, Joel Frucci, thank you for your time. Uh, senior editor of the Daily Football Show. Um, you've joined us and you, you've uh, blessed us with your time as, as you have almost every week on this program, so thank you. Pleasure, Bill. Any time. All right, Ahmed, we have uh, not much time to talk about the AFL. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need that much time. <laughs> now, you, there's uh, one game in particular that you want to have a look at. Yes. Uh, the uh, Adelaide versus GWS game. Adelaide there's been GWS. a couple of omissions. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. A uh, very important game, one of the most anticipated final series of all time, probably with such a uh, great season. We've got uh, Adelaide taken on GWS, first versus fourth. Adelaide, unfortunately, are going to be without one of their best midfielders, Rory Sloan. Uh, he took a, was rushed to the hospital a week ago, had to get his uh, appendix removed, uh, had some surgery on it, and wasn't able to make the cut by tonight. They're playing Thursday. It's a new thing they're trying, Thursday night games. Uh, should, be, should be good to watch. And unfortunately for GWS... And for Stevie Johnson, Coach Leon Cameron has said uh, he was not good enough the past couple of weeks, and he was the first. Stevie J was the first guy to tell him that he uh, can't make it. So um, mm. they've taken him out, put him in uh, Matt DeBoer. They think that's uh, good enough to take it. They've got a second chance, but um, should be a should be a great contest between first and first and fourth. Sorry, yeah. uh, just going to you. Your tips for the game. Who do you think is going to take it? Uh, I'm actually I'm tipping Adelaide. You can't okay. can't tip against them, especially at home. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, not. I want to touch on Rory Sloan. Uh, we have we have a quick highlight. We have a quick highlight of Rory Sloan. Um, I think early in the early in the season there was talk about him being uh, the best player in the competition. Mm -hmm. uh, just really quickly, do you subscribe to that? Uh, I believe he is uh, one of the best players. Unfortunately, um, wasn't selected in the All Australian team. He's not really one of those players that shows up on the stat sheet. As you can see here, it's all uh, effort plays, hustle plays. Um, so he is really important for their side. I think that even without him, they'll be able to get it done. But um, we're going to have to wait and see tonight, so it should be good. Uh, that's uh, enough for us, and we're going to have to head over to Adam right now. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I believe we have a, uh, a special live cross uh, coming in now, actually, with uh, the reporter of A Current La Trobe Affairs. Uh, hi, Adam. What's happening? To attend a uh, beef jerky festival. However, I'm two weeks too early, 25 kilometers off from the destination, and in a completely different dimension. So, as you can see, it's not going too well. I see, so not, you haven't actually had a lot of luck then, Adam. The gods have not really smiled on you on this day. No, this is correct, Adam. The gods have really pissed on me on this day. Oh, so it's just like the Hobbit trilogy then. 
what what do you mean Well, those were a complete joke. I mean, you know, Martin Freeman played the same character he plays in every other movie, and the last one, The Battle of the Five Armies, no one knew what was going on in that. It was, it was a shit show. But I, like, I liked them. I mean, they were, they were epics. Were they, were they not epics? No, they were complete crap. The Lord of the Rings were epic. Is, is, is this guy high? No, I, I, th I think you're wrong there, Adam. I mean, you know... Next thing you're going to say is the Dark Tower movie surpassed the books. <laughs> this guy. Is this guy serious? Is he serious? Cal Callum, can we? Where's Daniel? Daniel! Can we kill him? Wait, Daniel? Unbelievable. What a cocky bastard. All right, we're joined by Sheridan in the studio. Who's there, Sheridan? Back again. Um, I'm here to talk about my favourite thing, which is politics. Oh, we've got Extraordinary. Yeah. We're so excited. Can't relate, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so today I'm just here to discuss, I guess, the government's new controversial plan for drug testing people on welfare. Um, it's a interesting topic. I know many people at university who receive money from Centrelink. So <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um so basically, the federal government has announced that Mandurah in Western Australia is the third trial site for random drug testing on welfare. Um, the first being Canterbury Bankstown in Sydney's west, um, and the second being Logan City in Brisbane. And they plan to start the two-year trial uh, in January next year, obviously pending par parliamentary approval. Labor and the Greens are obviously opposed, so the coalition's going to have to rely on the crossbench for support, and that's including Pauline Hanson. So sorry, Kristen, about that one. Um, and they've chosen Mandurah, I guess, because of the higher drug use than national and state average. So nearly a quarter or 20,000 people are engaging in drug use there. And Bankstown and Logan were also chosen for a high level of unemployment and welfare. Um, in the March quarter this year, the unemployment rate in Bankstown was 7.37% compared to 5.2% in New South Wales and 5.9% in Australia. So it's been a long trend over time. Um, and that's around 12,000 people receiving new start if they're over 22, new allowance if they're under 22 in Bankstown alone. And they've also had an increase in ICE and ICE-related hospitalisation specifically. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I know that's a very prevalent issue, but yeah. how exactly would the trial work for these people? Um, so what's going to be happening is that there are around 5,000 people on New Start and Youth Allowance in Mandurah, and the government's expecting to test about 15% or 750 of them, and around 1,750 in Canterbury Bankstown. And so basically, if they test positive, the government will put up... To, up to 80% of their income on a cashless welfare card, which can only be used in person at an approved store or business. Um, so it's basically to be restricted to rent, childcare, food, clothing and healthcare. So basically you can't withdraw the money and spend it on alcohol or drug use, which is the whole point. Um, and then within a month they would go for another test and if they test positive for a second time, they'll be charged for the cost of the test and then referred to rehab or some sort of other treatment. Okay. Mm. So... Um We'd love to keep going, Sheridan, but uh, oh, that's okay. we've, come to, we've reached the end of the show. We've come to a close. Um, Sad cut once again, unfortunately. Unfortunately. It's, it's, just, it's just politics, you it's know. It's the reality of <laughs> journalism. Quite literally. Uh, yeah, pardon, pretty Jenny. much. It's funny. All right, well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank it's you. been the Eagle Report. Time is 12.59 p.m. Join us next Monday at 1 p.m. for the weekly dose. Meg we'll Kennedy, Adam Thank you so much tuned. for watching.